Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Within only a year and a half to two years of actively you know, dabbling and learning in this space, I've already been elevated to the world stage on AI policy and the way that you know these um, that that these things are happening. I, I I didn't think I'd be here for another decade. Hey everybody, it's Scott. It's Wednesday, and it's the Pitchworks podcast. Thanks for tuning in. So it's our 100th episode, but we haven't told our guest yet, and he hasn't walked in yet. So it's going to be a little bit of a surprise. We've got uh, a little bit of bubbly here on the table. Uh, thanks for tuning in with us a hundred times over the last couple of years. Uh, hopefully the content is uh, you know, still good enough that you want to subscribe to this fine program and then rate and review. I gotcha. Um, please do those things if you haven't already. I would appreciate it tremendously. This week, we've got Kenny Chen. You remember Kenny from, uh, I don't know, r- roughly about uh, 50, 60 episodes ago. Uh, it's Thrival time once again. Thrival's a big festival that uh, I'm a big fan of because of the just very useful purpose it serves to society at large. It's a really great way to crash ideas into each other and, and just figure out what sticks and figure out you know what we should be thinking about going forward. Uh, let's talk to Kenny. Let's surprise him with, uh, well, there won't be balloons falling from the ceiling, but let's surprise him anyway. So Kenny Chen, you've got a, uh, you've got a glass of champagne in front of you. And uh, this is definitely not going to be the main thing we talk about today, but we do have to take a moment and just point out that you are our guest for Pitchworks 100. That is freaking amazing. Hey, congrats. Man, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, you know, we we sat and wrestled with it for a minute and we're like, what should we do with 100? And Buzzy had a ton of ideas. I mean, he's done a bunch of different, you know, 100th episode kinds of things. And every one of them felt like stress. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It's going to be a bottle of champagne and somebody I enjoy talking to. And here we are. So I did have to work you a little bit to get you in here at the timeline that I wanted you in to make sure it turned out okay. I was like, yeah, you better get in here quick. Uh, but now you know what the subterfuge was all about. That's fantastic. I love you, Scott McTaggart. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for real, I do, yeah. I do enjoy talking to you. And I do think you represent, you know, some of the best things about the scene. Um, you know, it's, um, it's nice talking to you. And, you know, you're, you're always leaving money on the table. You're always making sure that other people are getting taken care of. And uh, that's the kind of person I feel like I want to ce- celebrate the 100th episode with. Hey, so. Likewise. And this is a fantastic milestone. I, I, I was just looking back over your guest list over the course of, you know, these, well, it was up to 98 yeah, up to yeah. Mark Bursick. And I was like, oh man, he's so close. We're he's so, so close. close. I'm so pumped. I wonder what he's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and man, it's, it's just. Sorry, like, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I wanted to pull the rug out from under you just a <laughs> tiny bit, though, because here's the thing, right? If I had told you in advance that we were that this was going to be happening, it would have become a little bit weird, a little dominant. And I, and I do legit want to have conversation with you because there's interesting questions in the air. Mm-hmm. But, you know, take it as a compliment. It's intended to be. Thank you for being here for our 100. I am honored. Thank you for having me. So let's dig in. Yeah. Um, the sixth thrival. It's a weird, those are two words that are weird to put together. Sixth thrival. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to even try to say that 10 times fast. Is, is coming up soon. And, you know, I, I have a bunch of questions. And last year, I think we were, we were exposing people to the idea of what thrival is, right? But this year, I want to dig in a little bit because there seem to be some real material connections being made as a result. Now I know just from, you know, moderating one panel last year, right? I made, I made some really interesting dots connect that never connected before. And, you know, I kind of want to dive in. So, uh, just for scientific purposes, can we try, um, try to identify what humans X tech is supposed to be pronounced mm-hmm. as so that I don't offend you along the way. Well, that's still something that we're, um, that we're figuring out on, on our end. I say humans and tech, humans um, and tech. others say humans X tech, because that is, uh, 
what is it, uh, semantically or uh, whatever. You know, it's the, like the, the right way. way to read it out or something? Uh, yeah, uh, well, okay. So so the X there is meant to represent a lot of things. So it could be additive. It could be multiplicative. Well, it I could assume be, multiplicative uh, from looking at it. It could represent kind of the intersection of two different uh, kind of veins of, of thought. And really, I mean, so much of what we're trying to do with Thrival on this front is to bring together – Sometimes uh, strange, you know, atypical combinations. It's art, yeah, in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> you're 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 eliciting response, right? You're <laughs> right. saying like these two concepts never get crashed together, but it mm-hmm. seems like it might be useful. Exactly. And then you finish with art, like in a more literal sense, in the fact that on what is it Friday night, it becomes thrival concert as opposed to thrival panel discussions and 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 you know, having luminaries speak on, you know, what it is that they, they know. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to know, cause I mean, I've been calling it humans times tech, mm-hmm. which sounds clunky to me. And I think I'm wrong. Yeah. So, uh, and let's, let's just go with humans and tech. Um, that's what I say. And I think colloquially, you know, that's, that's this defining relationship that we're trying to hone in on. And, you know, what we believe is that we're, I mean, humans and technology have already been in this dance over the past however many millennia, mm-hmm. but now it's really hit this kind of critical point where we're asking ourselves, are we going to be replaced by our own creations? Right. Is this- Or are we going to become inextricable from them? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you were just meeting with, um, you know, you had Ryan O'Shea not right. too long ago. Excellent talking example, about, who I was going to bring up. Yeah. Yeah. And so this question of like, what even makes us human when- there's already so many things that we've implanted in our bodies. We're inextricably linked to our smartphones. Um, in many ways, we have uh, millions of cyborgs essentially among us right. with far uh, augmented cognitive and sometimes physical ca- capabilities beyond what anyone 100 or even 30 years ago might have ever imagined. And the 30 is the one that makes me smile, mm-hmm. right? You know, I mean, it's. It's amazing the speed with which we are learning to adapt. And, and I do think Thrival lends something very concrete to not just like, you know, the people that study these disciplines, but actually the larger conversation that happens in, in living rooms and at kitchen tables, right? You know, the things that people talk about at Thrival tend to be fairly concrete, um, but still forward leaning. So that, you know, you, you can actually talk to your parents and say like, oh, you know what? I was at a panel where they were talking about how artificial intelligence might, and then, you know, mm-hmm. you jump off and it talks about maybe what your little cousin might have to do for work in 20 years. Who mm-hmm. knows? So humans in tech, see, that doesn't sound so clunky. We're going to go with that. Okay, great. Um, starts on the 19th mm-hmm. of September. Right. And tickets are on sale at thrivalfestival.com. That's correct. I want to make sure you get a proper plug. Too, no, right? I appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a big deal. Um, but I also get this feeling like you guys have learned from doing past thrivals about what direction and size and tenor you want the next ones and the future ones to take. Right. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, built upon battle scars upon battle scars. Yeah. Fill me in. Like <laughs> what, what lessons have you taken away from the first five? Well, and you know, this is speaking as someone who was not in town for the first one, right. only had the broadest inkling of what thrival was the second year, I think in 2014, mm-hmm. Um, went balls to the walls in yeah. 2015, went to everything. And it w- went nuts, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I've worked on 2016, 2017, 2018, and it's really moved organically. I mean, you know, it's a space where anyone who thinks that they can predict what's going to be top of mind and most pertinent next year uh, would, yeah, just be fooling themselves. And so each time around, you know, we start planning, I guess, the week after a previous one ends, and it's still not quite enough time. But I've seen the trajectory track from what was initially like a neighborhood, you know, local community based thing, then grow to encompass a city and then a region and then like a broader, you know, 
semi-national um, space. Then it moved to national, and now we've got um, our biggest international reach that we've um, that we've ever had uh, this year in 2018. And um, with that, you know, with that scope, we've really also come to terms with this unique kind of story and advantage that the city of Pittsburgh has, more so than any other city that that I know of, uh, you know, in the world that had a central and pivotal role in each of the previous industrial revolutions, you know, saw the fires of like, you know, post-industrial collapse being on the brink of extinction and then, you know, rediscovering opportunities in things like robotics and advanced manufacturing, automated systems, all of this kind of stuff. But what's happening here is almost like a forecast or the front lines of what will become the roadmap of how hundreds of other cities around the world are going to deal with this fast pace of you know, automation and advanced technologies. I think, and, and Mayor Peduto says th- these types of things a lot, Pittsburgh can teach the world a lot about not letting a defeat get you down forever. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you look at the peak of things where uh, Pittsburgh was producing more steel out of this one city than the entire Axis powers combined during World War II. Is that true? Yeah. That's insane. Um, and, you know, it, it played such a pivotal role in the shaping of all these different elements of like, not just the global economy, but and, and technology, but like the geopolitical infrastructure of the world as we know it. And the resilience story Mm -hmm. now educates us as we talk about, well, does AI mean I'm going to lose my job? Does uh, the IoT present as much opportunity? Like, are we as down on on the lows? Are we as high on the highs? Like, you just have to keep an even keel. And we've learned that the hard way, paid for it, how many different ways? I'll tell you something funny. My grandfather mm-hmm. was born in Pittsburgh. Oh, great. Then moved to Erie, where it was clean air, clean you know beaches, you know, nice place to live. And when my dad said, I'm moving my family down to Pittsburgh, my grandfather went, what in the hell would you want to do that for? Because <laughs> he's got this picture in his head of what Pittsburgh was. Mm-hmm. And it obviously isn't anything like what it is now. So um, one of the interesting things about your involvement with Thrival is the fact that you've got your fingers in a lot of pies, right? For example, the, um, the X Prize, you mm-hmm. play a role as an ambassador for the X Prize. Uh, you know, obviously everything that you do over at Ascender, which mm-hmm. is helping people launch and grow and, and those kinds of things. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is, uh, as I pour more of that 100th episode champagne into this, uh, this little glass over here, which let's be 100% honest, these are whiskey tasting glasses because... It's me. Um, you, you're involved in all these different things, and you get this exposure to, let's, let's isolate XPRIZE for a second, right? Sure. Tell people just by way of sort of illustrating this conversation what it means for you to be an ambassador for XPRIZE. Sure. And, and so, you know, as background, XPRIZE being a global nonprofit that's been around for the last 23, 24 years, uh, leveraging kind of multi-million dollar incentive competitions around what they call moonshots. It's breakthrough technologies that uh, have a tremendous uh, social impact, everything from ocean spill cleanups to starting the commercial space industry like in the mid-90s to early 2000s. And within the last few years, they've really... Um, built out more of a robust global community um, that's centered around maybe about a dozen ambassadors or so um, split between, you know, Germany, Japan, That's a really small number. Uh, There might be like 18 or or so. Still a small number. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But but yeah, I mean. Take the compliment, Kenny. Come on, man. I'm I'm setting you up for it. um, You've got the same problem I have. You can't take a compliment. (laughs) The ambassadors are essentially people who care enough about facilitating that kind of global connectivity and take a resourceful approach to finding opportunities to form partnerships, to inspire people, to um, to like throw their hat into the ring um, and and make the next like moonshot breakthrough 
uh, thing. And so really a lot of my role that's organically come about only over the past year and a half, like yeah, only for the past two, year and a half that I've been involved with XPRIZE, it's just been being passionate and excited about what XPRIZE has been doing. Yeah. Um, and then being given the kind of permission and leeway to run with it. Um, interpret that in a Pittsburgh and Midwest Rust Belt regional kind of context. Um, recruit teams, form partnerships, and that's... Yeah, that's opened a lot of doors for me. Yeah, well, but what's not to get excited about? I mean, we are talking about the future mm -hmm. and, and introducing people or at least hosting a room full of people that are trying to get to that connected dot that is more useful, that, that advances us to the next phase. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a host of connected dots, honestly. Um, so now you take that and you apply it as your sort of liberally shaking a bunch of ingredients together at Thrival, right? right. Same idea. Um, I have to believe that there are stories rattling around inside your brain where people met at Thrival. Maybe they were on a panel together or maybe someone was really into a subject and they raised their hand and came up and talked to the speaker after the fact where something cool came together because of this Thrival project, which again, seven years ago didn't exist. I mean, I, I don't know if you've got any examples on top oh, of mine. But. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we could spend the rest of this episode <laughs> talking about those things. I mean, even just talking about my connections that I made in 2015 and 2016 alone, uh, you know, meeting some of my best friends. Uh, I met Ryan Gaiman yeah, uh, yeah. in 2015 at the, uh, um, the, the theater in the South Side. Uh, because I asked a question and he found me afterwards and we ended up being uh, co-conspirators for the next two and a half years. Ryan around. hasn't been on the show. So if you could introduce people to his idea real quick. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he was running Citizen City as an impact um, uh, consultancy organization doing a lot of great things. And now he works for Ro Robotics. Um, Which is tremendous. Yeah, I'm going to get him in here. One eventually. of the fastest growing startups that's based out of a sender and um, is essentially taking dashboard mounted, any kind of camera, turning it towards the street and then utilizing computer vision, essentially AI to analyze street conditions and preemptively like deal with potholes and fix it like, before it needs to be filled. Exactly. Because it can cost 10 times more once it actually becomes a pothole as opposed to just like some cracks on the street that people might not even you know recognize. So every every thrival I think has an MVP or two. Like right. the people who are just there at everything and then clearly get the most out of it because uh, they're they're just, you know, genuinely passionate about what's happening and they like want to connect with uh, the people whose ideas are being shared. So I guess I was the MVP in 2015 because I went to 29 out of their 32 um, programs and sent them 27 pages of notes afterwards. That's pretty hardcore. Um, in 2016, it was probably a tie between Caitlin Lesk and Kilani Cook because they came to just about everything. Um, Caitlin ended up uh, sharing video, um, you know, like vlogs afterwards, talking about her top insights. Kalani just like rocked it with questions. And Kalani's another one I'm eventually going to get in here. You got to get Kalani. I keep here. trying. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Robotics, Kalani, all these are the people who have standing invitations. All right. Okay. We're, we're going to get them on here. Yeah. And let's just be clear. Kalani is uh, blockchain billionaire and mm -hmm. black tech nation mm -hmm. at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and she recently started another, uh, company or organization called, uh, distributed 49. I don't even know about this. Yeah. Um, I, I think she's working on it with Eugene Leventhal. who's also like a major blockchain kind of lead in, in Pittsburgh. It's the two of them. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, Kalani came back as a speaker for us in 2017 because we thought she was that awesome. Uh, Caitlin, we brought in on on um, on the back end. Like she was uh, just an incredible asset for us in in 2017, helping us with a bunch of different things. Um, and uh, we're actually meeting tomorrow to talk about how she's getting involved in um, in in this year. Aaron Watson, the same way. Yeah. Um, he spoke in 2016 and 2017. Um, you know. 
ANSYS, we, we brought Tom Marnick from ANSYS and had him speak on a panel that Aaron was hosting about blockchain. Yeah. When ANSYS um, did not have a blockchain strategy, I, and, and, and they went back like right afterwards and um, you're- That feels you know, dangerous. Yeah, they were saying to us like, hey, thank you so much for, for throwing us here um, there. We met with our executive team immediately after Thrival and basically popped the question of what are we doing with blockchain or you know broader distributed technologies? We haven't really prioritized how we're integrating or at least you know receiving these kinds of risks and or opportunities. Um, so we end up finding that by bringing um, you know even a lot of these corporate players who whom you would think have the answers and whatnot by putting them in an environment where they're being peppered with um, with ideas and technologies and industries that are sometimes tangential, sometimes completely separate from anything that they've ever thought about. Um, that serving as a kind of crucible for new ideas um, is completely within the realm of what we're trying to facilitate. This is why I think it's art, right? Like it's not, it's not the, the, the standard definition, but again, I, I'm a big believer in booster of artists because it's their job to make you think about things and question things in ways that you wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, and Ansys is just one of the most like sober, responsible corporate citizens out there. I've never heard anybody say like, oh, I worked there and it was terrible. It, it, people love ANSYS. Mm -hmm. But as I get older, I can feel that my area of expertise is has shifted. I'm no longer expected to be the person who necessarily understands the cutting edge idea or the new practice. The new practice is left to people who are studying specific disciplines and people who are not to put too fine a point on it, not as occupied with best practice, right? Hmm, so yeah. there's new practice and then there's best practice. And when you become an older member of the team, best practice becomes your job, right? And you have to intentionally inject yourself into an, into an environment such as Thrival so that you can immerse yourself in new practice. Otherwise, the power imbalance in your office makes it so that no one wants to make you uncomfortable and therefore you don't get those new ideas. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. We, uh, we used to call um, the, the different thrival assets, uh, what we currently call humans in tech used to be thrival innovation. Right. Uh, I remember, got, yeah. You know, music and arts, uh, that just used to be like thrival music. But, you know, that question of like, what, what do you even mean by innovation? Right. Um, was a big one. And I've been asked this repeatedly, you know, countless times um, over the past uh, couple of years, especially once my title changed to innovation director at Ascender. And let me just say one that word is that that is one word that's used for at least a dozen, if not like a hundred different concepts. And when put in practice, it's incredible how like the disconnects between what people even consider to be in innovation ends up keeping it from happening. So are you talking about incremental change or paradigm shifts? Right. Are you talking about, um, you know, trying to maintain best practices or, um, uh, or, you know, find entirely kind of left field, um, uh, spaces. Is it depth or breadth? Um, are you, so we had yeah. one of, one of your principal sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, Russ U oh, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. from UPMC enterprises who, you know, has been sponsoring thrival for a little bit now, Absolutely. um, came in and I, I asked him that pointed question. I said, you know, Tell me what innovation actually means. And I, I wasn't trying to be flippant. Someone has to ask this question and you're doing it maybe in a practical way by actually just throwing everybody up on the stage and letting them figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just had this thought and, and it's a way of kind of connecting those, those two things. You know, how does effective corporate innovation kind of end up looking like um, – the people who make the best connections during kind of an opportunity like, right. like thrival. And, um, 
you often hear people refer to serendipity. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, how would I have ever known that uh, Caitlin Lesk and Aaron Watson would cross paths like at this one thing? Or how would XYZ company realize that they had an unmet opportunity within this you know, kind of vertical. Um, I'm fully of the belief that like the majority of what we call serendipity is uh, manufactured, or at least there's a lot more control over it than, than we have. And it's based on kind of uh, systemic continued behaviors that put an individual or an entity into the path of opportunity mm -hmm. compared to, um, yeah, just kind of like, waiting for, for comfortable to, opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity where they feel as though nothing is at risk for them to try something new. Exactly. I mean, um, you know, f for example, the, the, the only reason why I'm involved in X prize, um, and have since been invited, uh, you know, now serve as like the Pittsburgh ambassador to the UN's AI for good initiatives I forgot and that one. just got added to the inaugural AI commons. Um, uh, oh yeah. The, the website just went live two days ago. Um, it's an AI commons network that is coordinating, uh, problem, sol uh, problem owners and problem solvers literally around the world. Congratulations. And th thank you. Like I'm, I'm still kind of in, in disbelief that with, within only a year and a half to two years of, actively, you know, dabbling and learning in this space, I've already been elevated to the world stage on AI policy and the way that, you know, these, um, that, that these things are happening. I, I, I didn't think I'd be here for another decade. So other so. than being on the Pitchworks podcast, what do you attribute <laughs> that to? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's, it's back to that kind of manufactured serendipity kind of thing, um, where the, um, and, and a big part of it, um, I think, also ties to, uh, to a combo of, um, I guess, open-mindedness and generosity. Um, so, you know, it, I think everybody expected you to say the first one, but maybe not the second. Yeah. So I, and I, I think, you know, I really want to emphasize the second where, um, uh, generosity and the power of giving first and, um, you know, the, the power of, uh, empathy for, for other people. I mean, really so much of what you do on this, on this podcast, um, you know, for, for Pitchworks is like, Scott, you put yourself in the shoes of the p person that's sitting across the table from you and you think of their business as if it was their own and you just give and give in terms of advice, you know, thoughts around improvement, best practices. And of course, the podcast itself as a means to uh, propagate that message and give them more opportunities from which serendipity might emerge. Um, I think you know, that is the probably, yeah, probably the most powerful kind of catalyst for these kinds of connections and opportunities. I subscribe to the art theory mm -hmm. that we were talking about in, in terms of what, what used to be called innovation and is now humans and tech. Mm -hmm. Like I subscribe to this. I truly believe that the sparks that fly off of one thing can turn into a fire somewhere else. And if, if somebody's just there to make sure that they get that energy, cool things can, can come out of it, right? And, and I honestly, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm kind of driving toward here is I think there's a lot of people that would benefit from attending the innovation sessions, the, the humans and tech sessions. Uh, sorry, I'm old school. I know from no, Pittsburgh, so yeah. I call things by what they used <laughs> to be called, right? So yeah, I, I think there is a group of growing companies and also a group of mature in at risk of fossilizing companies that need that full immersion. And honestly, like all of this was kind of by way of saying, how do we put the right words into those people's mouths so that they come out and actually expose themselves to why don't we have a blockchain strategy like Ansys did a couple years back, which you know how hard it is for a company to admit that this is something they should have been looking at, but didn't. Mm -hmm. um, 
if I'm the person who is the Kenny Chen of ABC Corp, I'm the innovation manager, innovation planner, I'm the future products specialist, I think I probably need to be able to make a case to my superiors or my executive team that this is a, and it's not an expensive ticket, it's like $200 if you buy the VIP. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I love the VIP experience, but you don't have to do it. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, it's not an expensive thing. It's three days worth of programming or two days worth of programming for the humans in tech um, where you can actually be there while take UPMC Enterprises. You know, is there basically crashing ideas together for you? And I don't know everybody who's on the, who's on the docket yet, mm -hmm. but um, that's, if I were you, that's the message I'd be trying to put out there on the street is, look, we all know that there's rust forming on our company, but your subordinates are afraid of telling you that the future is in a completely different market or a completely different product set or, you know, a different way of looking at the world. So just come to this thing and see what people say. <laughs> totally. And, um, you know, this, like going back to your previous question about how, how we learned over the years and have continued evolving this, um, Thrival used to want to be everything to everyone. You mm -hmm. know, we used to have, um, kind of back to back panels that would jump from, sports analytics to how to build a music e ecosystem, you know, within a city to, uh, you know, um, reducing food waste and improving sustainability. Well, outcomes. Back then you probably thought that demonstrating a big tent strategy would bring people in at a time when you were afraid about numbers, mm -hmm. but you're not afraid about numbers anymore. This time around we, um, and and last year as well, we we broke things out into uh, into chunks that weren't so much defined by the industry vertical or the type of technology that's involved, but more based on how how pertinent it is um, and you know accessible it is to people from different kinds of demographics. Kenny Chen, everybody. Make sure you turn out for Thrival Festival. It kicks off on the 19th. Happy 100th. Man, thank you. All right, that's the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in. And again, I, I appreciate uh, all 100, you know, and everyone that's been on the show. It's, uh, it's really been a lot of fun. We're going to keep on trucking, but uh, uh, make sure you check out thrivalfestival.com. And it's not that far away at this point. And, uh, you know, tickets still available. There's a couple days worth of programming, and then you know they finish it all up with a concert on uh, on Friday night, starting at 4 p.m. Hope to see you there. Hope to see you for the next hundred episodes. We'll catch you next week. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit Pitchworks.com. E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S dot com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.